Hey everybody, uh, welcome to Prairie Lakes Church Online. Uh, we're so glad that you're here with us today. And uh, we're going to be continuing uh, today in our, in our parenting series. Um, we've, been, we, we've been walking through this, uh, this series on how do we help our kids through some of the difficult situations in their lives. And, and today, uh, we're going to talk about this topic of gender. And so for some of us, uh, this, this concept of gender, is very, we're very comfortable with it. We can talk to our kids about it. We kind of know uh, what to say. But some of the rest of us, it, it's a little uncomfortable. Especially uh, today in 2022, we're just not exactly sure how to approach our kids and how to talk about uh, this topic of gender. And so that's what we're going to dig into today. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to sing some songs together, and we're going to open the Bible together, and we're going to look at this uh, kind of uncomfortable topic for some of us, and we're going to try to make it comfortable um, so that we can feel uh, comfortable and equipped in how to talk to our kids about, about gender. And so as we sing, I want to encourage you, if you want to sing along, please feel free to. Uh, if you want to open your Bible and follow along with us, please do. But if you're new to the whole church and God thing and you're just not sure, that's okay. Engage however you're comfortable. Just just, just watch if you want to and just kind of see what God's got to say to you today uh, as we walk through this service. But we're going to start with a chance to sing. If you're comfortable, please uh, sing with us. Yes, I am. I 
Hey, we are so glad that you chose to be here with us today. I'm Cody, I'm the digital pastor, and whether you are hearing this for the first time or the hundredth time, we need you to hear we're a no matter church. And what that means is no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, or even what's been done to you, God loves you and you can look for him here with us. And if you're new or even newer, I would love to help you take that bold step in getting connected because we know that connected people are growing people. So if you take that bold step here today, I'll send you an Amazon gift card just as a thank you. And you can do that by filling out our welcome card. It takes about 30 seconds uh, by texting PLC to 99581. And that's PLC to 99581. And connecting relationally is one of our next steps here. And uh, what that looks like typically is connecting in a small group. When you jump into a small group, you're gonna build authentic friendships. You're gonna have a group of people that have your back. And one of my favorite things about my group is I know uh, that I have a place where I can be vulnerable. I can share what's going on in our life. And I know uh, that I have a group of people praying for me uh, throughout the week. So if you would like to learn more or even try out a group, I encourage you to do that right now. Uh, you can do that by again, texting PLC to 99581. And the next step that we talk about every week is giving generously. And when you give generously, uh, you remove your security uh, and your trust being found in money, uh, which wavers up and down with your bank account, uh, but you put it back in God. Uh, where no matter what your account looks like, no matter what your circumstances look like, uh, your trust and your security is unwavering because it is found in Him. So if you wanna give generously, whether it's the first time or increasing in your generosity, you can do that right now at prairielakes.org forward slash give, and you can select your campus from the drop down. But we're gonna continue in our parenting series here today, so let's kick to Pastor John. Hey, good job getting here. We're really grateful that we get to do this. So, so I'm grateful that you're starting your week off this way. Don't ever forget this about prayer legs. I know you've heard this a hundred times if you're around here, or if you're new here, this might be your first time, but listen to this. No matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done or what's been done to you, God does love you. He does, okay? You can't stop him from loving you. And you can go on the journey to find him in this place. You don't gotta be perfect. You don't have to have everything figured out. But I promise you, we will journey with you as you look to grow in, in God and grow in your relationship with Jesus. So we're really glad that we get to do this together. Hey, on a personal note, before we dive into the message, last Saturday, our daughter Carly and her husband Ben had uh, twin baby girls. And uh, I think, I think this one is Davy, Davy K, and this one is Quinn Deborah. So that's number 10 and number 11 for us. And here's a, this is, this is really cool. This one kind of made me tear up a little bit. Here's our seven-year-old twin grandsons holding their twin cousins. I thought that was pretty cool. This is uh, Colton and Jackson, and this is either Davey or Quinn or Quinn. I don't know, but there they are. So praise the Lord, and, and we're really grateful. Thanks for all your prayers, uh, Prairie Lakes. All right. Hey, I've been a parent for 33 years, and I still don't know what I'm doing. And that's why it's always worth it for us to, to talk about families and talk about parenting. So we're in this series called, How Do I Help My Kids? And, and we're filling in the blank. Each week for five weeks, we're filling the blank. Now, it's not lost on me that not all of us are parents. Listen, I know that. Some of us aren't married. Some of us are called to singleness. Some of us are called to adopt. Some of us are called not to have children. Listen, I understand and we know that. But, but, but hear this. Uh, I, I, I know. However... We all have a stake in the next generation, okay? We, we do. They're going to be in charge, so uh, they're going to be our, our, our lawyers, and they're going to be our politicians, and they're going to be our teachers, and they're going to they're gonna, they're, they're gonna be in charge of us, okay? So, so we need them to be healthy and mature, and, and that's why we're doing this, okay? And if you've watched social media or the news or you've read the paper and you've caught yourself saying, what in the world is going on with this next generation? We're trying to do something about that, 
Okay, so, so that's why we're doing this. Now, be real clear on this. As we talk about parenting, this is a shame issue for a lot of people. And so no shame, okay? No shame in this parenting thing. No shame at all. Here's what we're trying to do. Let's just get better at this parenting thing. So that's what we're doing. Now, this week, here's what we're going to help our kids with. How do I help my kids navigate gender? <laughs> Some of you right now are going, no, don't, don't do it, right? And, and, and I, as we were talking about it this, this last few weeks, you know, we were talking about it, and all the reactions of people to like, you're what? Really? Great. Stupid. I'm grabbing my popcorn, right? So, so all the reactions in between. Listen, just take a breath, okay? Just, just take a breath. There's nothing off the table for us, okay? There's nothing. We've been canceled left and right multiple times. We, we don't really worry about that. But we're no matter church. And, and this is a real issue that's really happening in our culture, and it's really happening in our schools, it's really happening in our neighborhoods, it's really happening in our community, it's really happening, and as a no matter church, we're gonna talk about this stuff. So let's get this straight from the beginning, okay? Just get this straight with me, just, just smile, take a breath, smile, okay? Just smile. This is a huge topic, okay? It, with, with, with a confounding number of fuzzy trails that it goes down. Uh, the definition disagreements and real honest pain and confusion. And it's not just an issue that's, that's out there, right? It's, it's here right now. And, and this, is, this is a part of the culture that we live in. This is part of the society that we live in. And it's a part of not just the family table, but it's a part of your little Iowa. So let's have a starting point here as the church, okay? As the church. And as followers of Jesus, we'd say as no matter followers of Jesus Christians, let's set a starting point down from the Bible. Now, I understand this may not be your starting point. You may not be there yet. That's great, but I want to set down kind of the, the starting point uh, uh, for us. So here's just, a, here's just a, a, a big truth I want you to kind of hear where we're starting from, okay? So, so way back in the book of Genesis, you know, in the, in the creation account, um, it, it says this, so God created mankind in his own image, so it's God's image, and in the image of God he created them, and then it says this, male and female, he created them. So, so we, we go back, we start that. In, 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 math, in, in Genesis 5, you know, very similar, it says this. So he created them male and female and blessed them, and he named them mankind when, when they were created. Okay, so, so there's just this kind of a biblical trail, all of the Old Testament, where this is kind of an unquestioned truth and, and starting point with God. Uh, in the New Testament, reaffirmed again and again and again. In fact, here's one just from Jesus in Matthew 19. This is him talking, and, and it's in the context of divorce and some other things. And, and Jesus said to the people that were asking, he said, haven't you read? He replied that at the beginning... The creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, okay, father and mother, and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So, so, so just, just a starting point, right? And you may not be there, but our, our starting point is there's the two, two genders, male and female, and it, and, it, and it speaks about God's intentionality and desire for, for sustainability, and, 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 and like everything else that he created, there's this initial order, and okay, this, we, this, is, this is the starting point. This is where we go. And we also believe this. We also believe this, that, that sin has messed everything up, right? The purpose for Jesus Christ coming, and we celebrated Easter a couple weeks ago, is, is that he died for our sin, okay? And, and in Romans, Paul says just very flatly and very plainly, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's just this, this kind of stain that's over everything. Sin ruins everything. Sin causes pain and confusion in, in everything. And, 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 it, and it has in this issue, right? It has in the family. It has with the gender issue. It has with the marriage issue. Okay, this is what sin does. So really clear. I'm not trying to help you understand, nor could I even begin to dive into the complexity and the psychological and societal and cultural information around gender identity issue. Okay, I, I, listen, I've, I've been talking for the last several weeks knowing this one was coming. I've talked to doctors, I've talked to PAs, I've talked to counselors, I've talked to parents who are going through it, I've talked to people who've gone through it, right? All this, I can't even begin to do that. At the end of the, the message, your campus pastor or campus host is going to point you to resources. We have a really robust set of resources that kind of dive you down into all kinds of trails that you want to go to in. But, but listen, just, just recognize this is a real thing, okay? It's a real thing. And there's this spectrum out there. There's this kind of this spectrum from it's just a thought or, a, or something that kind of 
is, is a thought in my mind or a doubt or a fear in my mind or a question I have in my mind. And there's just this line, there's this, there's this spectrum that goes all the way to, to hormones or surgery, body altering, okay? So, so this gender identity issue, it's, it's, it's deep and wide, okay? It, it, it really is. But here's what you need to hear. This is coming to your kitchen table, mom and dad. It's coming to you, your kitchen table, Bible study hosts and, and small group leaders and, and sports chaplains. So, so whether it's your kid, the kids around your kid, or your friend's kid, we are going to have to learn this. We are going to have to learn how are we going to be navigating the gender issue. So here's what I'm going to do. Here's, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you four navigating principles, four navigating principles that are going to uh, hopefully, hopefully equip you, to no matter where this starts to happen in your life, whether it's your own kids or somebody else's kids, you, you can navigate this well. So here's principle number one when it comes to navigating the gender issue. Principle number one was this, and this, is just, this was across the board. Everything I read, every doctor, every PA, every counselor, every family that's gone through this or going through this, they all said this. This is the universal. Be a safe place for a dangerous conversation. Mom and dad, you need to be a safe place for a dangerous conversation. So, so I want to follow the pattern of Jesus. We always want to, we always want to look to how did Jesus act? Because these are, these are kind of these real world, how did Jesus act when, when, when he was in these kind of spots? Okay, so I want us all to turn to the book of John and go to John chapter three. So it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the New Testament. And go to John 3. And, and listen, there's, there's Bibles maybe around you. You may have to go run back to, your, uh, to, to get one out, your, pull your phone out, whatever it is. But, but we want you to eyeball the word for yourself. So in John 3, and if you'll kind of know this, John 3, 16 is, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his one only son, right? So, so there's that truth. But this is kind of leading up to that, like, universal biblical truth of, of God loves and saves us. And it starts in this in verse 1, a story about a man named Nicodemus, and here's what it says. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Now, remember, the Pharisees were, the, were kind of the legalistic, religious party who counted everything and checked all the boxes. And he was a, a member of, of not just the Pharisees, but he was a member of the Jewish ruling council, so he was a leader. He came to Jesus at night and said, and we're going to come back to that, but I just want you to see this picture of Jesus. Jesus was always a safe place to have dangerous conversations. So here's Nicodemus, and he, he comes to him at night, and there's some that would say, well, why, why would Jesus do that if he wants to ask him something? You should ask him in the daytime, or why doesn't he have the guts to just do it? L listen, because Jesus knew that this guy needed a safe place to work out what he was thinking and feeling and wondering about. And we see this again and again and again with Jesus. He was always a safe place for dangerous conversations. This is what he was. Parents, listen to this. You've got to be a safe place for dangerous conversations. Parents, you have to be, okay? You've got to be. This has got to start early, and it's got to happen often. And you've got to have lots of practice on all kinds of issues so that, so that when these bigger ones start at your table, you're, you're ready for it. They, they've, they've got to have this with them. And here's the, here's the principle. Here's, here's, a, here's a truth that you've got to know. You've got to understand how each of your kids is wired, and you've got to discover the talking place for each kid. Nicodemus, it was at night. That was a safe place for him. If you've got more than one kid, whatever you've got, listen, you've got to understand they've all got to have a safe place, a talking space where they are. For some, it's the, some it's the car. When you're both facing the head and the windshield, for my son, it was the car. We'd be driving, wouldn't have to make eye contact, but we could talk about all kinds of things like this. For others, it's while we're camping. For others, it's, hey, well, I got my kid out in the boat and, 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 and we're fishing. For others, it's, it's when we go eat ice cream together. For others, it's late at night or bedtime. For our girls, it was always late at night. You're dead tired and you're tucking them in and that's when they say, mom or dad, right? But, but you've, you've, you've got to be it, right? You've got to be ready for them and you've got to understand their safe place. Now, listen to this on this particular issue of gender. Parents, you may not be comfortable with this conversation. But your kids are. It is in front of them, around them, and, 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 and being taught to them. Okay? This is, they, they, they are not uncomfortable with this conversation. As a parent, you may say, well, I'm super afraid. I'm super afraid that the world has, has more influence than me. It's not true. Parent, you're still the primary influencer on your family. God gave you that. 
Maybe you're afraid of the topic. I don't know enough or, or I don't think I can do it well. And if you're honest, you'd kind of say, well, I don't want that for my kid. And, 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 and I don't want to mess my kid up by saying something wrong. Listen to me. Those are all real fears, but here's the starting point. You've got to be a safe place for a dangerous conversation. No shaming or dismissing. That's a non-starter. And if you can't be that place, if you can't establish that, you're never going to be able to navigate this issue. They're going to stuff it down. They're going to keep it quiet. Watch this, this, this short video from, from Shane of preparing parents. The next thing we have to talk about is how so many of us, our reaction is when we have that moment of discomfort, one of the first things we do is we take it out on our kids. Uh -huh. We feel disappointed in them, yep. maybe ashamed. ashamed of them, and maybe even for some of us as parents, dirty, gross, right. perverted people. Right. And so we feel that, feel that way about our kids. And if that's the attitude you're gonna have, it's gonna be really difficult for you to have a helpful <laughs> conversation with your kid in that moment. Well, and your kids absolutely know when you're judging them, right? Yeah. So to try to work through that stuff ahead of time yeah. so that you can be 100% available, non-judgmental for your kids to come and yeah. to talk to you. Okay, did you, did you hear that? Did you hear that? It, it, it's gotta be a safe place. And parents, we can't miss this one. Not shaming, not dismissing. This is a legitimate struggle and real issue. And there's lots of not sures and there's lots of confusion. You wouldn't push your kid away if they were struggling with the, with the other stuff. If they were, were struggling with, with worry or anxiety, you would, you would be a safe place for them to have that conversation. If they were struggling with depression, you'd be, if they were struggling with friendships or relationships, you'd be a safe place. My friends, here's where it's got to start. If we're going to navigate this as parents, and if I'm going to navigate this as a grandparent, We've got to be a safe place for dangerous conversations. Here's the second navigating principle. We have to be able to live in the tension. And that tension for us is truth and grace. That's the tension that, that we have to live in, okay? We have to live in. Stay in, in John 3 where we just were and just look down. And I want you just to see this tension and this confusion that's happening with Nicodemus. So it says this in verse 2, it says he came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you're doing if God were not with him. And so he stated that, he's going, listen, this isn't, this isn't computing for me, and I'm, I'm having struggling to understand it. And, and, and in reply, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. And, and, and Nicodemus in verse 4 says, how can a man be born again when, he is, when he's old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. And then, and then later he says, how can this be, right? So, so listen to me, parents, right? Listen to me. We've got to live in this tension of, 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 of truth and grace, of how do I, how do I sit in this one? In, 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 in Nicodemus, Jesus has given him a safe place to kind of, kind of live in this confusion and live in this tension. But check this out, this is, this is where we as a no matter church, and this is, this is where we sit, and this is why it's, sometimes it's hard to be a no matter follower of Jesus, it just is. In John 1, 14, just the first verse of this, the first chapter of the same book, John, he says this about Jesus. He says, the word became flesh. Now this is Jesus becoming man, right? So this is, and made his dwelling among us, and right, he walked among us, and he lived among us. And then John says, we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. And notice this, full of grace and truth. Full of both. Not like 50% truth and 50% grace or 70, 30 or 80, 20 or whatever. Jesus was full of both. Grace and truth. Truth and grace. And this is the tension that we have to live in. So when you, when you establish that you're a safe place for a dangerous conversation, just like Jesus is, then you have to live in this tension. Here's what we believe. Here's what the Bible says. Here's what our family values are. Here, here's, what, here's what Jesus says about this. And so, so you, you've got to live in this. This is what we believe. This is what, what we are, where we're at as a family, son, daughter. And it is very sad. And it's confusing. And it's hard to see somebody struggle. 
And we've got to remember that, that sin really has kind of stained everything and it brings pain to, to, to all kinds of things. Listen, truth and grace means this. We tell the truth because we believe God's the truth. We bring it with grace. We treat all people like Jesus did, with kindness and respect. And the belief that God loves all people, even people who are struggling with, with gender identity issues and stuff. We just, we, that's, this is that balance. And, 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 and the, the, the tension that, that we have and a lot, of, a lot of churches or a lot of Christians have is this, well, if I, if, I, if I show grace or if I empathize at all, isn't that kind of like tacit approval of, of the behavior? No, it doesn't have to be. Listen, but this is where we live, okay? We, we, this is where we live. We can, we can disagree and have compassion and kindness. We, we can. Mark 10, you're in John, and, and I want you to just go back to the left in your Bible a couple books to the book of Mark, and go to Mark chapter 10. And in Mark, again, it's this pattern of Jesus, right? So, so in, in, in Mark chapter 10, um, there's this story of, of this, it's, it's called the rich young ruler. So go, go down to about verse uh, 17, and, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke all kind of tell the same, this same story. Uh, a little bit different, each one of them, but it's the same story. And, and here's what it says, and follow this. It says this in verse 17 of Mark 10. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on the knees before him. Good teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So I want you to see something, kind of a timeout. I just want you to see it again and again and again. You've got to see this. Um, Jesus was always interruptible, okay? He always was. No matter what was on his agenda, no matter where he was going, he was always interruptible. Mom and dad, parent, friend, you got to be interruptible, Okay. You, got to, you can't be a safe place for dangerous conversation if you're not willing to be interrupted. You can't live in this tension of truth and grace if you're not willing to be interrupted. So, so the, the rich young ruler rolls up to him, and Jesus, you know, Jesus does what he does. He says, why do you call me good? Remember how Jesus always asks questions, and, 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 and Jesus answered, and, 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 and he said, no one's good except God alone. There's kind of this, Jesus kind of goes, so what, are you, are you calling me God? Is that what you're going to claim? Are you, are you going to believe me? And so Jesus says, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he says, teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. And then catch this in verse 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Do you see that? Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus loved him whether the guy decides to follow or not. Jesus is going to love him not based on any kind of merit system. Jesus loved him. And here's what Jesus says. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Now, <laughs> Jesus says, listen, I, I know what's black. You're a good guy. You're, <laughs> you're a good Iowan, right? God and stuff, right? You do, you're trying to do right. And he says, but the one thing that's stopping you, the one thing that's in the way of your heart is this. You got all this stuff. And you love your stuff more than you love me. You got to get rid of the stuff that, that's there. And catch what happens. At this, the man's face fell. And he went away sad because he had great wealth. My friends, just, just sit on this for a minute. Nobody's been argued or shamed into the kingdom. Jesus didn't grab him by the scruff of the neck and say, what's wrong with you, man? Why, why, can't, why can't you do this? Why can't you figure it out? Jesus let him walk. He let him walk because he told the truth. And he offers him grace. I can disagree. And I can still have compassion and kindness. I still can. So, so we've said so far, we're going to all have to navigate this. And parents, you are going to be navigating this. So we've said so far, we've got two, two navigating principles so far. The first one is, you got to be a safe place for a dangerous conversation. The second one, you have to, you have to be able to live in this tension of truth and grace. It's messy and it's hard. Okay, Prayer Lakes, we know that, don't we? All right, here's the third pattern. Here's the third principle for navigating. Have your stall phrase ready. I know you don't know what that means. You're going to in a second. Have your stall phrase ready. Okay? So I want you to watch this video. This is Nikki Pauli from Preparing Parents. Here is what every dad needs to do, and moms too. You need to have a statement prepared in your head to buy you time when your kid says the thing you didn't want to hear them say. Hmm. 
you know, and it could be about porn. It could be about sex. It could be I'm pregnant. It could be a thousand different things. But if you have the statement ready, something like, I love you. We're going to figure this out. Let's talk about it. I'm going to listen first. There's nothing you and I can't figure out together because I have watched too many dads, especially this can make me cry, say things that they would pay any amount of money to take back when their initial reaction was shock. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you've practiced that, mm -hmm. then you get to react in a loving, kind way that would invite your kid to come back the next time something goes wrong. Did you hear that? You got you, you, you to give yourself space and a moment so that you don't react because, because when they bring this dangerous stuff to you, if you shut it down, if your first word, your first thing is to shame them or your first word is to be angry or the first thing that comes out of your mouth is I can't believe you're thinking this. I can't believe you don't understand this. And listen, I have shamed my children. I've blown it in this way. Man, I wish I would have had this. I wish I'd have had this stall phrase. And no matter who you are right now, no matter what stage of life you're in. Don't you wish that your parents would have had the stall phrase when you came with them with a pretty hard thing that's happening or you're wondering about? Don't you wish they would have said something like this? I love you. And we're going to figure this out. Let's talk about it. I'm going to listen first. There's nothing you and I can't figure out together. What would it have been like if your parents would have said that when you came to them with your hard news? Or how about this one? No matter what, I love you and I'm here. Or how about this one? Keep talking. I'm listening. Help me understand what's going on. Parents, <laughs> you got to have a stall phrase. Because if you blow it in that first 10 seconds, you will shut the door. You will not be a safe place. You will not be a place where you can wrestle truth and grace. You will not be. You have to have this stall phrase ready. And moms and dads, hear this. Your kids will take their emotional cues from you. If they see confidence and joy and openness to what God wants to reveal, you know what they're going to do? They're going to be at peace. But if they see panic or anger, you know what they're going to do? They're going to shut it down and know they can never come to you again. And all of us have that story, whether you're a kid or a parent. You, when you were a kid and you came to with the news, and whatever that news was, and they shut you down. What would it have been like if your parents would have said, I love you. We'll figure this out together. So that's the third. That's the third. Here's the fourth navigating principle when it comes to the gender issue. Pump the brakes. Slow it down. Pump the brakes and slow it down. Don't rush to anything. And again, this was just another one of those kind of universal uh, 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 things that I heard from doctors to people who were dealing with it. It, it. Almost everyone had this same principle. Pump the brakes, slow it down, don't rush to anything. Don't rush. Kids are impulsive. Teenagers are more impulsive. Kids do not know what is best for them or really even know what they need. They just don't. Now, I'm in, I'm in no way dismissing uh, true gender dysphoria where there's real confusion. There's phases that kids go. I'm in no way dismissing that at all. But kids don't know what's best for them. Kids can't see consequences way ahead of time. Most adults can't. I talked to a... a uh, a mom this week who said her, I think she said it was nine or 10 year old daughter came home and had this statement for her, mom, I wanna be a boy. And of course, 
<laughs> this was a wise mom who didn't react, who didn't overreact, who tried to, tried to say, help me understand what you're asking, and, and would just began the safe place for a dangerous conversation. And as she dug into what her daughter was feeling and what her daughter was thinking and why her daughter was saying this, here's what she found out, that her daughter hated to wear dresses. And her daughter recently had been gone through the birds and the bees things, and she found out how babies come out, and she did not ever want that to happen to her. So therefore, I don't want to be a girl, I want to be a boy. And she worked through that. Now listen, listen, some of them, some of them are, are way more complicated. I, I, I understand that. But you've got to pump the brakes. You've got to slow this down. You can't rush to anything. Across the United States, across the United States, you can't get a tattoo if you're under 18 anywhere. You can't. You can't get one. And why, why is that law in place? Why is that there? Because you're doing something permanent to your body that, for the most part, can't be undone. You can't drink beer till you're 21. You can't vote till you're 18. You can't drive till you're at least 16. Kids don't know how to regulate eating ice cream, and they don't know how to regulate their own bedtime. Pump the brakes. Slow it down. Now listen, I understand. Not all of them are just, I'm scared of having a baby. I don't like to wear dresses. I know there's some, there's some true dysphoria. I, I know that. But, but psychology today even says this, that only a small number of children with gender dysphoria will continue to have symptoms in later adolescence and adulthood. But if you drive it underground, if you shut it down, and if you're not a safe place for your kid to talk about whether it's them or one of their friends, it's game over. It's a non-starter. And they'll get their love and information from somebody else. Hey, listen, I know. Everybody just take a breath, okay? Listen, this is it's complicated. I, I, I never knew it was so complicated. It's tough. And it's touchy. But mom and dad, aunts and uncles, Grandpa and Grandma, coaches, chaplains, you got this. You can do it. You have to navigate this, and you have to navigate it well. God made you. If you're a parent, God made you a parent. He gave you the kids that you have. You can navigate this issue, and any issue that comes up, you can do it well. Trust the Holy Spirit. Lean into Jesus. Lean into your godly friends. Lean into the Word. You can do this. You really can. And you really have to. Like Pastor John said, this is a conversation coming to your dinner table. And as a parent of three, uh, this is something that I want to be prepared to have conversations with to lead our kids in this topic with both love and truth. So I want to be prepared and I'm sure you do too. So for more resources uh, on this topic, right now we've curated some, you can get them on our parenting landing page by texting parenting to 99581. And we have many resources there on gender and sexuality. Uh, but this is something that you shouldn't go through alone. Maybe you have a parent in your life that has been through this season that has already led their kids through this topic. Or maybe you have parents in your life that are going to be having these same conversations soon or at a similar time as you will. I encourage you to go through this with them together uh, or you can reach out to us and we would love to help you navigate this with your kids. So you can send us a message on our social media and we'd love to be there for you. But kids, you are up next. Children's ministry is about ready to begin. So get ready for that. And we're going to continue in our parenting series next week. So we will see you then.
welcome to Kids Online. Hey Noah, any guesses what today's holiday is? Is it your birthday? No, it's not my birthday. Any other guesses? Is it my birthday? I don't know, Noah, is it your birthday? No, no it's not. <laughs> okay, so what's, what month are we in? May. Right, we're in May. So any other guesses here? Fourth of July? No, no, it's not the fourth of July. In fact, it's May Day. Here, hold on one second. Makes a lot more sense. <laughs> May Day, you know the day when you bring goodies over to your neighbors and you drop them off at the front door? That's so thoughtful. I always wanted my own May Day basket. Well, well, it's not for you. You see, I'm gonna go drop this off at my neighbors in a second. So, sorry, it's not for you, but maybe if you're lucky, someone will drop you off one. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, but in the meantime, kids, go watch this week's video, and maybe when you're done, you and your parents could make a plate full of cookies or even drop a Mayday basket off at your neighbor's house. See you later. What gets you down? Maybe it's getting benched for most of your soccer match, or a bad grade on that test you studied so hard for. It might be a fight with your best friend. Yeah, well you're one too. Or when you find out your family can't take a trip to the beach this summer. Maybe it gets you down when everyone else wins a gazillion end of school awards, and you get none. We all get knocked down sometimes, and it's tempting to just stay there. After all, Getting up is risky. There are no guarantees you won't fall down again. But God promises you don't have to do this alone. He's right there to take your hand and help you up. He's ready to walk beside you. He's gonna lead you. And if you do get knocked flat again, God still loves you. He still has an amazing story for you to tell. And he'll give you strength to start again. When you get right back up after something gets you down, others can see God at work in you. That's why choosing resilience is an amazing way to worship God with your life. Because worship is about more than just singing loud. It's all about living loud. It's hard. That doesn't mean we should give up. When the going gets tough and I wanna give up, I will trust in you. Cause you're always gonna lead, always gonna lead, always gonna lead me through. When I'm feeling overwhelmed and almost wanna quit, I will not give in. Cause you're giving me strength, giving me strength, the strength to start again.
everybody. My name is Erica. Have you ever been on an obstacle course? It's like a maze of challenges designed to help you jump higher, think faster, and get stronger. But to get to the end of the obstacle course, you've got to have resilience. Resilience is getting back up when something gets you down. So if you happen to get knocked over, it, oh, it doesn't have to be the end of the race. You can get back up and keep going. Every obstacle course is different, but you'll probably need to know how to climb. You'll need balance. You'll need to know how to get through the tight spots. And when an obstacle gives you trouble, you'll need to learn how to bounce back. There's a good chance you're going to face some obstacles in your life. In fact, sometimes life itself can feel like an obstacle course. But as you'll learn in today's story, you won't have to tackle these obstacles all on your own. So when you do get knocked over, oh, okay, who is doing that? I'll see you in a bit. But seriously, who was doing it? The Bible. It's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how He created us and loves us so much that He made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. Now, for an amazing story. Inspired by the book of Matthew, chapter 28, and the book of Acts, chapters one and two. Imagine that you are one of Jesus' closest friends, and three years ago, he invited you, you, to join him. Come, follow me. For three years, you followed Jesus from village to city to countryside as he teaches. You are the light of the world. Encourages. Blessed are those who are sad. They will be comforted. And heals. Get up, take your mat and go home. You know that Jesus is no ordinary rabbi. He's been sent by God. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. Soon, you think Jesus will reveal who he really is to everyone. Maybe he'll even lead a revolt against the Romans. With Jesus in charge, anything could happen. Blessed, Blessed is, is the, the one, one who, who comes, comes in the name, name of the Lord. Lord. But then, during the Passover week, things get dark. The rumbling threats from the religious leaders become real. One of Jesus' followers, Judas, betrays him to the leaders for a handful of silver. Jesus is arrested. He's given a fake trial, sentenced to death, nailed to a rough wooden cross, and then he dies. It's the darkest moment ever. It feels as if all the air has been slammed from your body. You don't know how to take another breath. You have no idea how you'll ever get back up. That's exactly what it was like for Jesus' disciples. His death knocked them flat, and they couldn't imagine how things could ever get better. But even in the darkest, downest moment, God was still present. God was still at work. And at the perfect moment in time, God raised Jesus from the dead. Don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Over 40 days, Jesus appeared to around 500 of his friends. He walked with them, ate with them, talked with them, at one meal, he told them, Do not leave Jerusalem. Wait for the gift my father promised. In a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. At last, Jesus' friends met him in Galilee, where it had all started three years before. Jesus! Peter and Jesus' other followers were so overwhelmed with amazement and joy at his presence that they fell down and worshipped him. Jesus came close and smiled at them. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So you must go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And you can be sure that I am always with you. 
to the very end. The job Jesus had given his friends seemed impossible, except for one thing. He promised he would be with them, right by their side, forever. He told them, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Then you will tell people about me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and from one end of the earth to the other. Then, right before the eyes of his friends, Jesus rose up into heaven. They stared, amazed and confused. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking at the sky? Jesus has been taken away from you into heaven, but he will come back in the same way you saw him go. How can Jesus be with us when he's gone? What about this Holy Spirit? Jesus' friends were filled with questions. Not only did Jesus expect them to get back up, he'd given them a giant job. He wants us to tell the whole world about him. My head is spinning. Jesus' friends waited for him in Jerusalem, just as he had told them. And within a short time, they discovered how Jesus would give them his power. The Holy Spirit came to rest on their heads like tongues of fire. As the Spirit filled them, many were able to start speaking and understanding languages they hadn't known before. Wait, you're speaking like an Egyptian. But all I said was, would you like a cookie? In the language of the Egyptian. <gasps> it's the power of God's Spirit. We can speak to everyone now. Jerusalem was filled with believing Jews from many nations who had traveled to Jerusalem for the festival of Pentecost. And they spoke many languages. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Peter addressed the crowd. The other Jesus followers shared his words in every language. Jesus of Nazareth was a man who had God's approval. God did miracles, wonders, and signs among you through Jesus. With the help of evil people, you put Jesus to death. But God raised him from the dead. God has made him both Lord and Messiah. What should we do? Turn away from your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then your sins will be forgiven. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm ready. Me too. Me three. God's Spirit was so powerful in the followers of Jesus that 3,000 people believed in Jesus and were baptized that day. Wow, this is really happening. People will try to stop us. The religious leaders hate even the name of Jesus. But whatever happens, Jesus is with us. We can get back up, keep going. That sounds like a bottom line. Through the power of God's Spirit, the early church in Jerusalem grew quickly. The believers shared their lives. They studied and worshiped and ate together. And their fierce joy continued to draw people to Jesus. Though their challenges were just beginning, the believers knew that the power of God's Spirit could carry them through anything. When Jesus was on the earth, he gave his disciples a mission. He told them, go and make disciples of all nations. All nations! That would have seemed like an impossible mission. But Jesus also gave his disciples a promise. He said, you can be sure that I'm always with you to the very end. So the disciples knew they wouldn't have to face their impossible mission alone. Sometimes for you, and me, life can seem impossible. But guess what? God is always with us too. When you're trying really hard to get something done, <laughs> God is with you. When you feel like every step you take has to be perfect, God is with you. <laughs> when you're worried about school, when something bad happens out of your control, when you don't know what's going to happen next, God is with you. That's the one thing to remember today. God is always with you. That doesn't mean you won't have to face any obstacles, but it does mean that you won't be alone when you do. Ha! Not this time. I got you. <laughs> resilience. Bounce back. That's resilience right there. I'll see you next time. Bring it! Bring it. Oh.